Last summer, my family and I traveled to my hometown, Bishop, California, for a family reunion. It was amazing. I hadn't been there for over 10 years because my family doesn't live there anymore. When we drove into that valley and I saw my mountains again, I just bawled. I was overjoyed to be there, and it was even better to be able to share it with my kids. We had an amazing time. We hiked all the hikes. I showed them all my favorite places. We had a 4th of July barbecue at a dear friend's ranch. We had lots of cousin time, reunions with old friends, a beautiful bike ride. We checked all the boxes and then some. But it was also a terrible trip. We woke up at the crack of dawn and drove an hour to the airport. My son lost his flip phone on the airport parking shuttle. We ended up finding it, but that meant seven Archibalds running through the airport as our names were called over the loudspeaker. After our walk of shame onto the full airplane, we had to beg a few kind strangers to change seats so our three- and five-year-olds didn't have to sit all by themselves. If any of the passengers on that plane knew I would be writing about travel tips, I would have been booed off that airplane. Then came a two-hour ordeal at the rental car place when they didn't have a big enough vehicle for our big family, despite our prepaid reservations. All this with a six-hour drive ahead of us to get to Bishop. This trip sums up travel with kids perfectly. Amazing and terrible all at once. Which, when you think about it, actually sums up parenthood in general, too. Luckily, it's usually the amazing things that stick. This is the How She Moms podcast with Whitney Archibald. I'm a mother of five on a mission to help moms connect with your kids, manage your homes, and create your own unique version of motherhood. I curate ideas from different moms so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. As you may have guessed, the trip I talked about in the intro did not actually happen last summer since not many of us traveled at all last summer. This episode was recorded pre-COVID in 2019, so that trip seems like eons ago. But when I re-listened to this episode, it made me excited that at least some travel is starting to happen again this summer. And it's all still relevant, so I hope you enjoy it. With all the family road trips that will surely be happening again this summer, this is the perfect episode to introduce my new sponsor, Baby Trend. When they shipped me their new car seat to try out, I hadn't realized how many strong opinions I have about car seats. Many of them claim to be compatible for a wide age range, but this new seat from Baby Trend, the Cover Me 4-in-1 Convertible Car Seat, takes it to the next level. The inserts for infants, which they call the comfort cabin, are truly secure and comfortable for even tiny newborns, and my five-year-old fits great when I converted it up all the way to a comfy booster seat. It's approved from 4 pounds all the way up to 100. This also makes it the perfect seat for grandparents to buy when grandkids come to visit, since they can buy one seat and adjust it to fit different grandchildren and then keep adjusting as they grow. My son especially loves the cup holders and the sun canopy, which is actually quite sturdy and has a nice feel to it unlike the flimsy ones we've had in the past. What I like about it is that it's really intuitive to install and change to the different heights and positions, both rear and forward facing. It has clear diagrams right on the seat, so you don't have to dig out the manual to wrestle it into the car. And the great news is that it's affordable, even though it has a premium feel. The regular retail price of the seat is only $149, but for How She Moms listeners, you can also get 20% off when you buy it from babytrend.com and use the code COVERME20 with a capital C and capital M. And since my own kids are almost out of the car seat phase and I can get by with the two booster seats we have left, I partnered with a local organization, Riley's Ark, to find a good home for this awesome baby trend seat with a family that can use it all the way from an infant seat on up. You'll hear more about this amazing organization and the woman behind it, Megan Gutensberger, and you can find more about the organization at Riley'sArk.org. This episode is all about traveling with kids, which makes me exhausted just thinking about it. Traveling with kids takes patience, planning, and creativity, even on the trips when you're actually leaving them home. But it can be done, and usually it's worth all the pain. When I started researching this topic, I was amazed at how many families make travel a central part of their lives. I came across families who sold their houses to live in RVs and travel full-time. I came across many who take two or three big trips I'm talking like overseas trips with their families each year. This kind of blew my mind and opened up possibilities. So I wanted to talk about this strategic level up front, how much you travel and how you incorporate it into your life. 
My husband and I actually come from families with quite different travel strategies. When I was growing up, we had two family trips a year. One to go to Utah to visit my mother's side of the family, and one to go to Sacramento to visit my father's side of the family. There were usually a couple of camping trips thrown in there and some day trips here and there. We did live in California, so there were a lot of things close by. My husband, on the other hand, was quite well-traveled by the time I met him. His family actually lived in Germany for three years, in his middle school years, and so they traveled all over Europe. His dad also traveled for work, and so they had lots of airline miles, and so they would go places like Hawaii together and all these exotic locations. The good thing is that both of these strategies were great. I cherished the times that I had visiting my cousins and my other family members, and we loved those trips, and he cherishes his memories. There are as many different travel strategies as there are families. Researching this topic has opened up a world of possibilities to me beyond the traditional family vacation. The first one is the idea of travel swaps. My husband and I have enlisted our parents to watch our kids a few times while we have traveled without them, but it's a lot to ask and it can be hard to coordinate. And some families don't even have that option for one reason or another. Lara, Carolyn, and Kelly got around this by taking turns and watching each other's kids. Each couple has three kids. When it's their turn to travel, the other two families take turns watching their kids and they go somewhere fun, from weekend trips to bigger trips like Portugal, Mexico, and even a European tour. The key to making this strategy work is to find families of a similar size. Last year, my family of seven recently teamed up with two families of eight, I know that sounds crazy, to do our own swap. When our friends traveled, we ended up with three extra kids one weekend for a total of eight, and four extra kids another weekend at our house. It was crazy, loud, fun, and a lot of work, but it was a great investment. My husband and I got to spend a weekend doing a bike race together in the mountains. It was wonderful. Another option that's also very good for the budget is a staycation. Travel doesn't have to be far-flung or expensive. When we were first married, we met a fabulous family who were experts in home tourism. They compiled bucket lists of local attractions and day trips and spent most weekends checking items off those lists. They knew all the best hiking and camping spots nearby and all the best ice cream shops, parks, and museums. To get started on your own local bucket list, pretend you're visiting from out of town and browse tourism websites for your city, county, and state. Check out books from the library and make a list of state and national parks in your area. A few years ago, Christina and her family made a goal to plan a local getaway one week each month. She wrote a great blog post called 8 Tips for Finding Adventure in Your Own Backyard. I'll link to that and all the other blogs and podcasts that I'll mention in the course of this episode in my show notes. Another great travel strategy is taking trips with individual kids. Nicole and Jared take each of their kids on two solo trips. The first is a U.S. history tour when they're 10. They've been to Boston, New York, and Washington, D.C. And then, around the time their kids are graduating from high school, they take an adventure trip. Something like scuba diving in Florida, river rafting in Costa Rica, and cliff jumping in Belize. Megan and Jason do solo trips a little differently. Each kid gets a solo trip with the opposite gender parent at age 12, and then the same gender parent at age 18. This is a great strategy because then you don't even have to get a babysitter, and there's a lot of great one-on-one -on -one time. Several of my friends also do individual trips with their kids when they graduate from high school, often giving the kid a budget and letting him or her do all the planning. You can even take this a bit further and do kids-only trips. When my friend Ruth lived in Florida, her oldest son traveled to see his grandparents in Arizona every year by himself. It was a great way for them to spend time together without the chaos of the whole family visit. Plus, it was much cheaper. Taking a cue from Ruth, when our oldest son was 10 and he saved up money to buy yet another giant Lego set, we convinced him to use that money to pay the unaccompanied minor fee for a plane ticket to visit his cousins instead. And then we used airline points to pay for the flight itself. Kristen's current strategy is to plan travel around her husband's business trips, since his airfare and their hotel is covered. 
This works especially well for their current stage of life because her kids are young enough that they're not in school yet. They research each city they visit ahead of time, and they try to do a mix of touristy and local activities. Another friend of mine liked to take his teenage children on business trips along with him because they were old enough to occupy themselves during the day, but then they could hang out in the evenings and add on an extra day or two at the end. Then there are the big adventures. Researching for this article has left me amazed at the grand adventures some families undertake. The Smith family has traveled to over 40 countries as a family. They write about it and share lots of travel tips on their website, ourfamilypassport.com. I first heard about them on the podcast Family Looking Up, and I'll link that episode as well. We have several friends who have taken a year or two off from their regular lives to travel with their families, many of those for humanitarian service abroad. And there's a whole subculture of families who've sold their homes and live in an RV traveling and road schooling full time. Josie, a friend of mine from high school, and her family, including three children, are on their fourth year of one of the biggest family adventures of all, a 10-year sailing trip around the world. You can read about her on my blog as well. Okay, so all of this sounds lovely, but it also sounds expensive. Family vacations can get pricey, but you don't have to win the lottery to make it work. In addition to traveling close to home or camping out, one way to afford family travel is just to make it a priority and sacrifice elsewhere. One of Nicole's famous quotes among her family members is, Do you want to go to Disneyland or do you want to leave that light on? She and her family once went an entire very hot summer with no air conditioning while they were saving for a trip to dive with sharks in the Bahamas. Nicole is also an expert at finding travel deals and discounts online. Her family paid $3,000 for that trip to the Bahamas when it would have cost $21,000 at full price. The Smith family that I mentioned earlier keeps a separate savings account for travel and puts something in each month. They also save by cutting their spending on things like eating out, cable, and gym memberships. Another great idea is to give vacations as gifts. Each year, the Nackis family gives plane tickets as their main Christmas gifts, so the money they would have spent on toys or gadgets goes towards meaningful family experiences. The Smiths took this idea a step further, and one year they decided not to give gifts at all. Not birthdays, Christmas, Mother's Day, no presents. All the money they would have spent went to their travel fund. Jessica Dobolich, who blogs at flyingwith4.com, suggests cruises and all-inclusive resorts as some of the most budget-friendly ways to travel, especially if you can look for deals. Then, of course, there are those people like my brother who puts in the time and figures out all the credit card deals and airline and hotel reward programs. There are tons of websites that teach you just how to do this. Figuring out where to go and what to do is the fun part. But then comes the packing, the not-so-fun part. The only thing worse is probably unpacking at the end of a trip. I used to truly dread packing for a trip because I always knew I would forget something, and it was just a lot of work when my kids were young to pack up five suitcases besides my own and get ready for a trip. But since then, I've learned a lot, and packing is actually not such a daunting task anymore. We had our biggest packing win last year, actually for the trip that I mentioned in the introduction to Bishop. We had had a crazy week, and while I usually like to start packing a week before the trip so that I make sure I don't forget anything, we had just had one thing after another come up so that I was barely home the whole week before we went. To add to that, My husband and I actually went to a concert the night before our trip, and it was one of those that we knew we would be up till at least midnight. When we left for that concert, nobody was packed, but I had packing lists that I had created for a different trip, and I quickly revised it, and I handed it to my 13-year-old and asked him to make sure that everybody got packed while we were gone at the concert. Once we got back, we packed ourselves and just trusted that everything was in the other suitcases. We didn't even inspect our kids' bags or anything. It was just basically a leap of faith. But once we got there, we realized they had done a great job. And they were actually really proud of themselves that they had accomplished that big job. So the first tip is to create a standard packing list. That saved us for that trip. 
Jessica Dahlquist, host of the awesome podcast Extraordinary Moms, also has a standard packing list, but she laminated hers so that she can just hand them to her kids and they can check them off with the dry erase marker as they pack and then reuse them later. But the smartest thing she does is that she also has a separate last minute packing list for all those things that you need to use even the morning before you go on your trip. So she has a list that includes things like her phone, her purse, her chargers, toothbrushes, pillows. This is so smart because I always have that nagging feeling that I've forgotten something really important on my way out the door. The next packing tip is to pack right out of the dryer. Marjean used to pack her kids up as she did laundry the week before the trip. She lined up the duffel bags in her laundry room and then just filled them up straight out of the dryer. This saved the step of putting the clothes away first. The kids were in charge of packing their own backpacks with anything they wanted on the trip besides clothes. Kareen, at some semblance of order, does all her laundry the day before a trip and packs up as she pulls clothes from the dryer as well. She has a great road trip packing list on her website. A different Jessica, who also happens to be a packing genius, Jessica Dobolich at flyingwith4.com, has a great system of setting up a packing station when she's getting ready for a trip. She lines up four suitcases, one for each of her four children, in her bedroom, and then the week before she goes on the trip, she lays out their clothes in front of their suitcases. This allows her to take her time and make sure she's not packing too little or too much for each child, and that she's not forgetting anything before she stuffs it into the suitcase. She does this in her bedroom because it's a place that has a lot of floor space and she can lay everything out and leave it for a while without worrying that the kids are going to come tramping in and out and mess everything up. The next idea rocked my world. I stumbled upon Sarah Loosley's article about this at Power of Moms just in time for a multi-stop road trip we took several years ago. Instead of packing bags for each person, she suggests packing bags for each stop on your trip. So then you only have to bring one bag plus a communal toiletry bag into each hotel. Following her advice, we had all the supplies we needed for the specific activities at each place right in one bag. It was amazing. Saren also packs one bag with church clothes for the whole family and then one bag with sweatshirts or jackets. So nobody's like rifling through bags, throwing things everywhere. They're all in one spot. It has revolutionized the way we do road trips. Another great idea is to keep outfits together, especially for smaller kids. When Adrienne packs her kids' outfits, she puts them in Ziploc bags for each day, so they can just grab and go. Jenica uses packing cubes for the same purpose. Another idea that I had never thought of was renting equipment at your destination, especially for babies. I didn't even know this existed, but there are companies all over the world who will meet you at the airport with baby gear that you can rent during your vacation, so you don't have to lug all that baby paraphernalia around with you. Meredith rented a high chair, portable crib, and car seat from a company called Todgo when she traveled to Germany. You can find a whole list of equipment rental companies at travelmamas.com. Another great idea from Saren is to pack light. Her rule of thumb is two to three pairs of pants and three to four shirts per person, no matter how long you're going. She intentionally chooses clothes that don't show dirt, so you can wear them several times. And she figures that unless you're traveling somewhere totally remote, you can usually find laundry facilities in a pinch. As far as packing light for you, Rachel Bagley of Cardigan Empire has a great system for packing a travel capsule wardrobe so you can fit everything you need for a trip in a carry-on and still look great. She suggests that you bring just 10 articles of clothing that can mix and match to make 12 different outfits. She explains her whole system on her website. Another great tip from Jenica is to keep your toiletries packed. She has a permanent travel toiletry bag with everything from toothbrushes to hair products. She restocks it as they use items up, so it's always ready to grab and go. And then she has a separate medicine bag as well that she can just grab. She also has a multi-purpose kit that she takes everywhere with her, whether she's traveling or not. It's a little bag called In a Pickle. It has zippered pouches inside where she can keep hair elastics, ibuprofen, allergy medicine, hand sanitizer, sunscreen, post-it notes, lip gloss, you name it. The fabulous parenting podcast, What Fresh Hell?, also has an episode dedicated to packing for a trip. 
Spoiler alert, bring lots of Ziploc bags. These airtight bags are essential for traveling with infants between blowouts and spit up, but they can also be handy for kids of any age, both on the road and in the air. You never know when you'll need to contain something wet, smelly, or dirty. Okay, so now let's talk about traveling on an airplane. The first step to a successful flight, especially with young kids, is to prepare the kids ahead of time. When Juliana travels with her five kids, she prepares them for the flight by talking through the process they'll go through at the airport. She tells them what will happen when they check in, go through security, ride the train, board the airplane, all of those little steps. Even for small kids, knowing what's going to happen seems to help them understand what's going on around them and prevents meltdowns. When they get to the airport, she talks about what's happening and gives them additional details about what to do. She tries to be calm and not stressed out herself so that they pick up on that and they follow suit. She also tries to be really aware of how each kid is feeling. If kids are scared, hungry, tired, or sick, she gives those feelings credibility and tries to meet their needs. A little empathy goes a long way. This is such a great idea, and one that I've actually never tried, <laughs> because many moms think to prepare kids for the flight itself, but not for the airport, which can actually be the hardest part. Sarah Powers, co-host of the podcast The Mom Hour, had the great idea to make the whole process almost like a scavenger hunt, offering a jelly bean or other small reward after they make it through each new step. Cam prepares her young son to travel by reading books about the destination, listening to local music, teaching him a few key words in the local language, and printing coloring pages of famous landmarks and areas that they'll be visiting. She creates a fun countdown starting about two weeks before departure. Last year, Candace took her twin two-year-olds to Italy. To prepare them physically for the time change, she started adjusting their sleep schedules 10 days before their flight with the goal of getting the time change down to just four hours. She created a schedule that adjusted their naps, bedtime, and wake-up schedules by 30 minutes every two days. Kristen used to spend a lot of time prepping for and stressing about airplane travel with babies, but after a few terrible flights with a crying baby, she realized that it's only a few hours at longest a day of her life, and that she and the other passengers will get over it eventually. Of course, she still tries to avoid the meltdowns and the crying babies, but sometimes there's just nothing you can do. She prepares with activities and snacks for her two young children, and she's as courteous as possible to the other travelers. But sometimes no amount of preparation can prevent a meltdown. That said, there are some things you can do to make airplane flights more pleasant for you and your kids. Juliana makes sure her iPads are charged and that movies are fully downloaded. She tests the headphones and even had her 20-month-old practice using headphones before a trip. Each child, except the baby, is responsible for packing his or her own backpack with snacks and activities for the flight. This teaches them responsibility, plus they can't complain to her if they don't have what they want on the flight. And sometimes you just need a helper. Since Juliana gets airsick, she knew that she couldn't fly all by herself with her five kids when her husband couldn't come, so she bought a ticket for her sister to accompany her. My favorite advice about kids on airplanes comes from Margaret Abels, co-host of the podcast What Fresh Hell. She coined the term sky rules for her philosophy that parents are allowed to throw all other rules out the window on flights with kids as long as they're quiet and happy. So sugar, screens, nothing is off limits. Just give the kids what they want. Keep them quiet. You're going to land soon. Until then, sky rules all the way. Cam always stocks up on dollar store toys for a flight so that her son has new toys to play with. She also usually brings a small Lego set. For herself, she brings a scarf that can double as a blanket and a travel pillow. For her son, she brings an inflatable footrest. Now let's talk road trips. Ah, the family road trip. Like many of you, my childhood memories involve imaginary lines that siblings couldn't cross and rolling around in the back seat without seat belts. My dad used to record the sound of entire movies like Ghostbusters on cassette tapes, and we'd listen to those and Disney read-along books. And of course there was singing, lots of singing. iPads and DVD players and seatbelt laws have brought us a long way from those rustic road trips, but it's still a struggle to keep kids entertained and, most importantly, not fighting or whining. 
I must say that my family has reached a golden age of road travel because we don't have any screaming babies. That has been a game changer. It's amazing. Once everyone can be entertained by a screen, you're pretty golden. That said, we try not to spend the entire trip with kids on screens because it's a great time when you're cooped up all together to interact and enjoy some of the good old-fashioned road trip traditions. Fortunately, I stumbled upon several road trip geniuses while researching for this article. Here are some of their fabulous ideas. Before Sydney's grandkids go on a road trip, she buys snacks and toys from the dollar store and wraps them up, one for each hour of the trip. It can be as simple as three starbursts, a bag of pretzels, or a small puzzle. Sometimes she even wraps up a storybook and then sends a recording of herself reading it so the kids can follow along in the book as they listen to her reading it. That's so cute. Each hour, the kids open one present. The anticipation and element of surprise entertains them the whole way. Similarly, Jamie lets her kids eat one Jolly Rancher every hour. They last a while, and it helps the kids count down the time. Elise has her kids do something active, even just running around in the front yard before they get into the car for, for a long drive. And Saren organizes active games at rest stops for the same purpose. Gotta get those wiggles out. I'm a big fan of audiobooks and podcasts on road trips, and once... One very memorable road trip, we got an audiobook of some knock-knock jokes, and they were terrible. They were the worst jokes ever, and we have never had so much fun. We just groaned at all the terrible jokes and kept going back for more. We were all just cracking up, and it was one of our favorite memories of a trip. And then there's always the good old-fashioned car games. You can go with the classics, I Spy, We're Going on a Picnic, or the Alphabet Game, but I came across a few more that were a lot of fun. One of our family's favorite games is Fortunately Unfortunately, where you take turns going back and forth between fortunately and unfortunately to make a story. So, for example, you'll say, fortunately, we're heading to Yellowstone. Then the next person will say, unfortunately, the bears have taken over the park. The next person says, well, fortunately, they're only charging one jar of honey for admission, and you just go back and forth between fortunate and unfortunately. Ours usually end up with the world exploding, so we had to put a rule that nothing's allowed to explode. Then there's the classic Two Truths and a Lie, which is a lot of fun. The license plate game, another classic. Would you rather... And then you can always go with some conversation starters. You can buy sets of cards with interesting questions, or you can just come up with your own. We also like to play the initial game, which is like 20 questions, but with people. So you start by giving the initials of a real or a fictional person, and then they ask you 20 questions and try to guess who the person is. We also like to play singing games like Encore, where you split into two teams and you have to keep coming up with songs on a specific topic. One game that I just discovered that we haven't tried is called Cows on My Side. So you get points for spotting cows first and you keep track. You can find the rules to that and some other fun car games in my show notes. Elise also likes to buy window clings for the kids to play with on the road. And Brittany brings cookie sheets with magnets for the kids to play with. Be careful with this one because I bought all kinds of magnets for one car trip only to realize that our cookie sheets are not magnetic. So <laughs> make sure you have the right kind of cookie sheets if you're going to try that. Several moms also mentioned Water Wow activity books for both air and road travel. Another thing that I feel like I should have thought of, but I didn't, was to bring neck pillows on road trips. I think of them for airplane travel, but they're also really handy for road trips. Brittany always packs snacks like dried fruit, veggies, and crackers in individual snack bags so they're easy to pass around and cleaner than eating right out of the bag. She picks things that they don't usually keep around the house so that they're a novelty and exciting to eat on a road trip. And instead of putting ice in her cooler, she freezes water bottles so they double as a backup water supply. And of course, no one is allowed to drink anything but water because of the inevitable spills. When she goes on just quick weekend trips, Jenica packs in laundry baskets rather than suitcases. Then she has a laundry hamper and a portable mudroom to store shoes or jackets, and they're easy to pack up. It's hard to give advice for once you get to your destination, since it's always so specific to the location. 
but there are a handful of tips that will work at any destination when you're traveling with kids. Cam and Shani from Our Family Passport recommend scheduling one relaxing day for every two scheduled days on a family trip so the kids can catch up on sleep and just do their own thing. I love this idea. They also suggest you take advantage of the hotel laundry service so you don't have to overpack. Jamie stumbled upon a great travel idea when her son wanted to buy a soccer ball in Italy. She gave in, even though it seemed like a bulky thing to have on their trip. But then it turned out to be so much fun for the whole family to kick it along as they were walking all over Europe. They just bought a little travel pump so they could deflate it and inflate it whenever they wanted. Kareen dresses her younger kids in matching brightly colored shirts when they go to crowded places like amusement parks. Her older ones aren't too excited about that, so they wear, wear what they want, but the little ones wear the matching shirts. She likes to keep those shirts in her bag, not the individual kids' bags, so they don't end up being worn on the wrong day. Most importantly, when you travel with kids, you have to have realistic expectations. Everyone will have a different idea of what a successful trip looks like. Make sure to plan activities for all the varying tastes and ability levels of the people you're traveling with. Your kids may enjoy and remember splashing in the fountain at the park just as much or more than touring that beautiful cathedral. Happy traveling! Thank you for listening to the How She Moms podcast. If you like it, tell a friend. The bigger the community, the more ideas. There are lots of ways you can add your ideas to the How She Moms community. We have a Facebook group where we share ideas about upcoming topics and help each other solve problems we're facing in motherhood. You can also follow How She Moms on Instagram for quick tips and ideas. And you can go to HowSheMoms.com where you'll find transcripts of episodes and lots of other great resources. Special thanks to my mom, Susan Singley, for recording my theme music. She played this song all the time when I was growing up, and to me, it's the soundtrack of motherhood. <laughs>